Make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. Why? Why the wing sweep? In, um, there was a period in the 60s where uh, real high speed dash capability was considered a requirement in order to either intercept bombers coming in, uh, Soviet bombers, or alternatively to penetrate enemy defenses. So yeah. high speed, low altitude was also. At the same time, uh, the uh, designers or planners, how would you say, the people who set requirements for defense systems decided that we, if airplanes like the F-105, the Republic F-105, they were really fast, uh, but the saying was at the time that if, if you built a runway that went around the entire world, the Republic would build an airplane that needed every inch of it. <laughs> and um, so the consequence was of that type of aircraft is that we were getting tied to very large airfields. And so if you have a, a very few, very large airfields, you can ground your entire air force just by cratering some runways. And so at the time, it was decided that what we needed is an airplane that could both go very fast and land on relatively unimproved or uh, shorter runways. So you could disperse your aircraft and have them much harder, much harder to neutralize your your Air Force, and at the same time, uh, McNamara, he was the Secretary of Defense in the 60s, decided that these people in the military didn't really know what they were doing, and that it really was possible to do a fighter, a single design that would do, <clears throat> excuse me, do all, thing, all roles, really. So it could be an air-to-air -air fighter, it could be an interceptor, it could be low altitude attack, long range. And I, anyway, so as a consequence of all this stuff, leaving aside the fact whether it was practical or not, and it wasn't, um, the consequence was you, you had every airplane as a, des, uh, every airplane design as a consequence of compromises. So you, you one way, so you, you <laughs> You have an airplane that's built for solely for high speed. It can't stop the land very well. And so the whole wing sweep thing was a way to engineer away some of the compromises. So with, uh, with, the, air, with the wings out at 16 degrees, all the airflow goes over the entire wing. Uh, you can have extensive uh, flaps and slats to greatly increase the lift at low speed. And, uh, but all those things are huge drag at higher speed. So if you build wings that can be someplace else, uh, when you're on fast, then, then you have what's called spanwise airflow, whereas the wings get fully aft. A lot of the air kind of flows to the side, comes to the side off the wing. And the effective, because of that, the effective speed of the airflow over the wing is, let me get, get my number straight, the sign of the wing sweep angle. So the sign of 72 degrees, for instance, is a pretty small number. Mm -hmm. You multiply that times the, uh, times the true airspeed, that is the, you know, the, the uh, flow of the air over the wing, and that also becomes a very small number, and that's really what kind of drives the drag down. So that's the argument. Those are the arguments that gave us variable wing sweep. And so the F-111 was the first. Uh, then the F-14, 
uh, tornado. Yeah, probably tornado. Tornado, about that. Yeah. Tor tornado came in in the 80s, I want to say. Was that when it started entering service? Yeah, the yeah. 80s, yeah. So, and then the MiG-23, the uh, SU-24, Backfire, and B-1. So I think there are seven airplanes, seven operational airplanes in total that have variable geometry wings. And I, and you notice we don't build variable geometry wing airplanes anymore. Yeah. You know, it was a, a fad that came and went and nobody's even thinking of doing one. And uh, the reason for that is that the assumptions of what we needed for uh, aircraft is unimproved wrong and to some extent um didn't really need to dash the you know uh you know the b1 wouldn't look like it does if it wasn't designed to go supersonic yeah. nor would the f-111 right if it would and it probably would have been a better airplane if it wasn't right uh, you know because it, it, because when you toss in a wing sweep system uh then suddenly a variable geometry wing, suddenly it imposes some real serious, uh, well, compromises. I mean, you can't engineer out compromises without incurring other compromises. And one of them, uh, a significant one, is in a conventional wing, fixed wing, the loads carried by the wing go through multiple spars. Mm -hmm. and be, and so you can spread out the load over the entire wing, and you and you put in spars, and they basically make the wing very very strong. Mm -hmm. um, with a variable sweep wing, since you have a hinge, all the loads have to be taken at the hinge. Mm -hmm. So so I think in the F one eleven the there was a pin, it's probably about that big around, and the entire wing structure came to that pin and that's all all the loads for the airplane were taken at that pin so that kind of that drives some limits as to first of all you got to build that thing really strong which makes it kind of heavy and um then the next consequent the, the next compromise that comes in is that the wing has to get, have somewhere to go so as you fold the wing back, the wing has to, you know, some of it will go into the fuselage, but if it, you know, it has to have some place to go because then it will crunch the fuselage. Yeah. And so as a consequence, all variable geometry wing airplanes have narrow wings, that is a, a narrow cord, and very high wing loading. Mm -hmm. You can't get away from it. And that high wing loading becomes especially apparent if you're building an airplane like the F-111. F-111 empty weight was about 50,000 pounds. Well, you add, you know, typical internal fuel load of 30,000 pounds on top of that, and it's big because you want that range. Um, and then add stores. You know, our combat takeoff weights were close to 100,000 pounds. Cracking. And the wing loading gets really high. Well, that's okay if you're, you know, um, if you're doing low altitude, high speed flight, wing loading can make it much more tolerable than in a lighter wing loaded airplane because a lot of the turbulence just kept, gets taken up by variations in angle of attack rather than uh, shoving the airplane around. And that reduced wing area helps in the high speed regime. Uh, but Ultimate and the and because the the wing get the wing sweep centers of lift change and you have to add complication to flight controls, um, and so it really was a design that was born of um, perceived requirements that at the end of the day uh, just really didn't plan, pan out. And if McNamara had really wanted to build a good multi-role airplane. It would have started like something like the you can go from an F from an air to air fighter to an air to ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Never works going the other. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And so we we have an airplane like the F fifteen E, which is an uh, the F fifteen, which is an extremely good air to air airplane, and can be made into a uh, ground attack airplane 
almost as good as the F-111. But the other way around, it would have just been, been horrible. Uh, so anyway, that's the, uh, that's the background on, on why variable wing system uh, airplanes existed for a while. Um, I suppose the other interesting part is from a personal aspect. So I, I came out of pilot training. And I've been flying a the T-38, which is, I don't know, 10,000-pound airplane. I can't forget, but it's a, a, a real sports car of an airplane, super simple. Um, uh, flew, in, you know, a lot like, you know, it's probably a combination of the F-4, better wing loading than the F-4. But it was, you know, a reasonably simple airplane. Mm-hmm. And you go to the F-111 and you just you add this whole thing, this whole wing sweep thing on it which greatly complicated flying. You know, T-38, you know, the wing always did what the wing always did. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't doing something different at one point and yet something else at another point. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for instance, the uh, 38, we, when you're doing uh, like air combat maneuvering in the 38, you knew you could feel when you're getting the high angles of attack because the airplane would start to buff it. Uh, the airflow would start to separate at higher angles of attack, and that turbulence would impact on the, as it rolls down the wing, would impact on the top surface of the wing. You could feel it. It'd be like going over a little bit of a rough road. So you could kind of play the turbulence and know where you were starting to get into a real energy losing situation. The onset of Buffett very wildly throughout the uh, wing sweep uh, range of the airplane. If you were up at about 35 degree wing sweep, the Buffett onset would be about the same as a 38. You put it back in 72, you'd be out of control before you got any Buffett onset. That added complications. Um, the you know, and then you just have this whole new system here. You have the wing sweep handle, and then you got to remember, okay, I'm taking off at 16, and the flaps and the slats come up. But I can't just do flaps and slats like you could in 38. You just run the flap handle up and hit a notch and run it to slats up because they always worked. And there was one thing that Jeff, like I always think that it was a bit strange. I don't know if it was for you, but uh, the wings uh, – um, the lever was like up here, whereas like on the F-14 and the Tornado was down by the throttle. Was that a bit of an inconvenience when you were I, flying? I guess I never thought of it. Right. It was always where I needed it to be. And I think the difference between the uh, F-14 and the Tornado were tandem. So front and back. Yeah. And the cockpit was a lot narrower. And because the cockpit's a lot narrower, then you don't have, you just don't have room over here. Mm. Makes sense. And so you have to put it someplace else. Uh, the 111, because it was primarily ground attack airplane, needed a large radar dish. That radar dish drove side by side seating. It drove the width of the fuselage along with fuel requirements. And so the, the cockpit was wider, and it was probably, I don't know, three or four or five inches underneath. There was a sill underneath there where the the fuselage came up mm-hmm. and met the canopy sill, and there, so there was space to put it there. But it was always where I needed it. It was, you know, hands on the throttle. You came up here, you just rotated it, and then you know moved it to where you wanted it. And so that part I never really thought about. It, it just made sense for that design. I don't know if it would have made more sense somewhere else, or you know, my guess is they put it there because they had to. Right. Whether it was better or not, I, I don't know. Uh, but it really was a little bit uh, strange having to think about wings, which you never thought about, in pilot training. And the wing sweep system made the flaps and slats complicated. And because they were complicated, very much like actually like the uh, flaps and slats on airliners. Okay. On a, on a fighter, uh, you have a simple. Most fighters, in fact, I think all of them do. They have slats, and then uh, Fowler flaps. You're just simple hinge. Mm-hmm. So hinge up, hinge down. That's it. Looks like water. And I can't remember right offhand. I can't think and talk. I can't even think most of the time. But thinking and talking. <laughs> um, 
airliners, you ever see the flaps go down, they have veins inside. So, you, you know, it's a multi-section flap. So the flap goes out, which increases the wing area, and as it goes down, uh, there it will pull out slats, not slats, or veins that duck some air from underneath the wing over the top of the flap to delay separation. So there, I think we had like no, it was like five sections, four or five sections on each wing, wow. and these these uh, flap systems, and then there are four or five sections of slats. They had to accommodate the flexing of the wing under load. The wings flex. I don't know if you haven't seen any pictures. I don't know if I have any good ones, but from the back of the air, you um, may have seen some. Anyway, the wings could flex significantly. And so the flaps had to, the flaps and slats had to accommodate that flexing. And then when you needed them, they had to work. And I probably had a half dozen times, maybe not that many, several times in my career where the vein just got dislodged and your flaps are coming up and they just stop halfway up. And you come back and land, you discover that a, a vein has gotten sideways. And then you get to see the honeycomb inside when part of the airplane tried to smash the flap. I mean, the flap vein. Um, the other issue when these things are complicated is that th there were, I'm going to see if I can cut this a little bit short. Um, there were systems in there to stop the flap slats moving because if they didn't, you could get an airplane that was really badly, like you could get all the flaps up on one side, right. not on the other um, if you didn't pay attention, and I saw this happen twice, as I, I was on the wing of a guy, you're always supposed to when you put the slats down. You're supposed to wait till the slats fully extended before you got the flaps down. Otherwise, you may end up with a situation where you have slats down on one side and nothing down on the other side, and a system that's locked out. Now you can't do anything about it. Um, and uh, I saw that happen twice. Not a real bad situation not too difficult to handle but when i was a brand new guy at canon pretty new uh, somebody even newer than me came in and on one of his first flights just did like did the 238 flaps up slats up mm -hmm. and lockout system failed and everything came up on one wing and nothing came up on the other and they almost punched out of that airplane wow really so the that wing sweep you know you never hear of that happen to other so the wing sweep system did add complications there. Um, and another complication like I want to talk about as well, because uh, obviously the hard points, like how many swiveled with, you know, the rotation of the wing? Each wing had four hard points. The inboard two pivoted, so they were always aligned with the, the airflow. The outboard two were fixed at 26. Right. And the I and no, that was done for Strategic Air Command that bought the FB-111. So in order to get the range they needed out of the airplane, it had uh, internal, <clears throat> the weapons bay had an internal fuel tank, which I think could hold 4,500 pounds. And then there were, you could put on four wing tanks, which I think held about 3,000 pounds each. Wow. Well, the problem is you once you take off, it, well, the wing's at 16, it's a super low speed limit. So to get any speed out of the airplane at all, just even normal cruise speed, you have to get the wings back to 26, but you can't, there's not enough room in the wing out at that distance to put in a mechanism that's strong enough to withhold this. So they just lock the uh, hard points on stations one and two and seven and eight at 26, and then the airplane just looked goofy as hell. Because <laughs> you know, I, I never saw one flying that way. I know they flew them because whenever SAC did did their exercise stuff, they would fly them. But I've seen them at uh, SAC bases sitting on alert, and you have these four wing tanks on the outer two pylons and the uh, outer two hard points on each side. They're pointing right at the radar. So in, in combat, they would run the wing tanks dry and punch them off, and then be able to do. Then they would heave a sigh of relief they got rid of those nasty things but in uh because we had never had that kind of mission requirement in uh in the tactical airplanes they were just completely unused never had the uh internal uh internal fuel 
Mm-hmm. They, the tanks existed, but I never saw one where they were installed. I guess they were leak prone or something, but mostly they didn't. Our almost all our concept of operations once you get outside of El Dorado Canyon didn't require them, and even then, that's why you have tankers. Mm-hmm. So, so how often would you like? I mean, what wing position would you be in? Like, uh, just you know, two to run around doing your normal sorties. Well, if so, I take off uh, sixteen degree wing. And I remember, I don't remember that video that I did a while back, you know, flaps and slats come up and you can see the wings move back to 20 seconds. Um, so we're, if we are in lower airspace, below 18,000 feet, and not engaged in, in training mm-hmm. of some sort, we're typically running around 350 knots. So at that point, depending on the weight and altitude and some other things, we'd be somewhere between 26 and 35 degrees. And mostly that's, you're not really doing any maneuvering at that point. And so you just set the wing screen to give you an angle of attack between 8 and 10 degrees, because that was the optimum angle of attack that reduced all the, you know. Anyway, so we run around at 8 to 10. And then if we went down in low level during the rolling, day, where you do a lot more maneuvering, tack formation kind of stuff, where you you know do turns to, you'd be you could easily be pulling three to four Gs down at altitude. Um, and so typically it'd be a 35 wing, and that gave a because you're not you don't really want to be just dicking around with it all the time. Yeah, yeah. It just I mean it just doesn't save you enough to make it worth it and. Um, and 35 degree wing gave a real good balance between, we'd be down, I think, about five or six degrees angle of attack. So you had a lot of margin. If you're up at around eight or 10, you start maneuvering, then I think the stall warning system comes on at like 14 degrees. And if you have a high pitch rate coming on, it comes even sooner than that. You start getting forward stick pressure at about 12 and, you know, some other things. That, you know, I'm really pulling numbers out of my rectal data bank here because it's a lot, long, long time since I thought about it. <laughs> so 35 was a pretty good number for on the range, uh, you know, low level maneuvering during the day. At night, where, because you, you could be, you know, I think 60 degree bank turn and tack form was a standard turn. That's what are all the you know, the various turn maneuvers were predicated on so you could both maneuver and stay in position. But if you needed more, you know, you got to 80 or 90, whatever you needed. Um, but we, at night, the uh, TFR won't command anything past 30. You can command up to 45, and at 45 it says, I'm done, and boom, up it goes. So the bank angles weren't as great. And so you're maybe talking one and a half G's, uh, typical, you know, max G loaded. Of course, TFR can command up to four, but at those those uh, typical training speeds of 480 knots at night, we'd be about 45 degrees. And would your whistle be watching the wings as well? Or would he like mention like, okay, you need to change wing or was it all up to you? No, almost never. He, in the airplane, the, the E model in particular, which was uh, the navigation was solely by yeah, ancient, well-worn hand tool yeah. techniques. He was so busy Bird keeping up with stuff that right. it was like, you know, dude, you've got your job over busy. here. And, <laughs> you know, I'm mean, sure they do their monitoring, but really the, whole wing sweep thing was kind of you know although there were times there had been missed at least one mishap i know of where you know if nobody's what monitoring where the wings are it can turn into disaster in 15 seconds absolutely you know, i'm sure i told that in one of my previous ones about yeah the thank you have, yeah so um, repeat here and one thing i want to ask as well like um how often would you be back into 72.5 wing almost never Right. The uh, during Desert Storm, our ingress speeds were a lot higher than during um, training. So we were going about five fifty, I want to say five forty, five fifty, and that started to get pretty fast. And so we'd be running at about a fifty-four wing. 
right. on the way in. On the way out, where the airplane was slicker, because get rid of all the weapons, uh, we'd, well, I'd be running, I think, at a 60 wing and doing 630 to 660. And it really made a difference. If you if you move the wings up to 45 at that speed, you'd knock 30 knots off the airplane easy. Mm -hmm. Easily 30 knots. So wow. think about the only time I went 72, you go with supersonic, which uh, in Europe we did sometimes over the water uh, on account of maybe because we could. Yeah, that's the reason. <laughs> um, and uh, now as we did it, it'd be 72 and a half. And then I remember during fighter weapons school, we did a uh, kind of a, we had a, a flight or two or it was just envelope demonstration. Uh, mostly we didn't fly at high altitude because there wasn't any point to it. And the airplane, unless you're going supersonic, just absolutely ran out of gas. About 34,000 feet. You are right. <clears throat> you are right at the, but uh, yeah, subsonic, you were at the edge of the, uh, uh, right at the backside of the power curve, mm -hmm. which are also some charts that are very interesting in there if anybody wants to claw into those. Because the backside of the power curve in a variable geometry airplane is a very frightening place to be. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have altitude, you won't, the airplane doesn't have enough power to fix it. Yeah. And I do remember uh, we were on exercise and a, it was in the early 80s, a big snowstorm came in, and in those days, I guess, forecasting just wasn't good enough, and closed Haver. And they really wanted to keep the exercise going, so they stacked us in orbits, and I was in orbit over the North Sea, east of, uh, east of the Wash, I think, and stacked up at 40, 34,000 feet. Mm. And... Uh, 26 wing, I'm trying to do the optimum everything, I go into a turn, lost a couple, three knots, angle of attack started creeping up, and but, but went to afterburner, not enough power available. And I started coming out of the sky. Now, I was thinking, okay, we're, we're talking big sky, small airplane here. I bet ATC's got other things to do rather than watch me, so I just lost <laughs> a thousand feet to pick up the airspeed and then climbed up, uh, climbed back to my assigned altitude. Uh, but four or three, four years prior to that, in a similar situation, the, and I was operating a, at a proper airspeed. I would say you, if the flight control system wasn't in takeoff and land, then you had to maintain your airspeed above 250 knots. So that meant you had to have wings for 26 and either flight control system artificially triggered or flap slats past 70%, some stupid number like that. And so the uh, supervisor flying by the uh, wing leadership said, uh, we want you to go to max endurance. We don't want to divert any airplanes. Well, max endurance was like 220 knots. So they're telling these guys to go into a flight regime, which they were prohibited to go into. And nobody thought, hey, um, over here, call on me. <laughs> well, this guy's up there 220 knots, goes in and turn in the hole, starts coming down, starts losing altitude, thinks he's going to hit the guy below him, and goes to full AB, reefs it in to keep his altitude, and the airplane went, see ya! Wow. <laughs> Boom. Wow, really? Yeah, so he, uh, so he jumped out, and the airplane pancaked into a farmer's field, and, and the... Uh, and the crew landed not too far from a pub. They walk into a pub, and the pilot says, uh, you know, I want to use the phone here. He calls a squadron and says, hey, this is, fill in a blank name. And the sergeant at the desk says, hey, stop screwing around here. We're having an exercise, and, and get off the phone. <laughs> this guy was a really big guy. He uses up his last 10P to call the base again. <laughs> and and uh, he says, if you hang this phone up, Sergeant, what's your name? I will rip your freaking head off. So I'm going to get my mic and hey, this is still on the <laughs> I left your airplane in pieces out in the field here. Anyway, so uh, sorry to get uh, sidetracked on that. Another thing I guess might be interesting to talk about is wing sweep failures. Right, yeah. I, I actually... Um, 
did a little search trying to find somebody who written anything about wing sweep failures. And there had there was an airplane back in the <clears throat> when the uh, A model first came out, had a hundred hours on it. These guys were coming off the bomb range and um, right wing came off. Mm-hmm. It's hundred hours in the airplane, there goes right wing, crew's dead. Um, that one, you know, find all kinds of stuff about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they ended up doing, uh, I don't know, that's going to get boring, so I won't go to that. I couldn't find anything about wing sweep failures, and I do know of a couple. Uh, there was a Lake and Heath 111 that had the wing sweep fail at 54. I think it was 54. Right. And I think, and they thought about bailing out on that out on that one because the landing speed, I think the tires had a, the limiting speed on the tires was about 217 knots, 220 knots. So above that, you know, guarantees okay. off. And those are C-130. Those are the same, the main landing gear tires in 111 are the same as on the C-130, by the way. Oh, right. To give you that. I didn't know. Unimproved field capability. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, anyway, so they did land that one. Lake and that particularly wrong. I think they had a 12,000 foot runway and they did land that one. And the only other wing sweep failure I know of happened to me, oddly enough. And so I'd gotten, uh, I'd gotten uh, to Mountain Home and, uh, so I was doing my first checkout flight at Mountain Home, and we were deployed to Boise Airport because they were working on the runway. Not that that matters. So we do the walk around, instructor pilot and I. He's in the right seat, I'm going to be on the left. And we do the walk around, we get in the airplane, and one of the first things you do in the pre-flight is make sure that the wing sweep handle agrees with the wing position. Right. Because you have these two giant hydraulic motors and the poor little starter that's trying to start the engine is going to spin the engine and the hydraulic pumps. And we've got this giant load of say the wings going from 16 to 26 or vice versa. Um, it, it's just not going to be, it, you might get up to starting RPM, but then the air, you're going to get a hot start because the starter just came to up. poor thing. Um, and so he, he, he looks, he says, hey, you need to move your uh, move the wingsuit handle handled 26. And I look and I go, no, 16. He goes, no, 26. I go, uh-uh, 16. <laughs> and I looked at it, and, you know, and the pointer and the wingsuit pointer and the indicator for the wingsuit, they were also at 16. I go, I, and so he goes, get the truth, you know, crew chief's on the inter- intercom uh, headset. And Mike Banker was my, my instructor pilot. He says, hey, what are the wings at? Uh, and the chief goes, no, yeah, 16. No, 26. Boom. We're done. I even yeah. pounded the air. Because there, there's a shaft, a big shaft that joins two gear boxes that turn the wing. And that shaft connects to the gears. So each motor, so maybe there's, I think there's one shaft. Motors both drive that shaft. Anyway, it, it, they're, they're synchronized. They can't. They can't not be synchronized. So yeah, of course. They impounded the airplane. It didn't move for two weeks, and nobody ever got back to us to tell us what it was. And I have no idea. I don't. We would have had no warning whatsoever. Well, I'm not sure what would have happened because we taxied with a 54 wing. <laughs> right. Okay. So so we clean flaps and slats up and we put yeah. them back. It's actually with 54 just because the, the wingspan was, you know, avoid hitting stuff. And then as you get out to last chance, you put the wings out, flaps and slats down. So some, you know, there may have been annoying grinding sounds from the back or, mm-hmm. you know, pieces flying out or something at that point. <laughs> so it, it's likely we wouldn't have gotten airborne with that. But that's the only other wing sweep failure right now. At least that part of the system was... Uh, was pretty reliable. Uh, all I was going to say, the only other time I flew at 72 and a half was at fighter weapons school. We were doing, as I said, the envelope 
demonstration. And, and, one, and one thing we airplane was good at, but we never did because there's no operation paid for it, was just hauling ass at altitude. Yeah. And uh, so we were up at about 40, 42,000 feet doing about, I think it's about Mach 1.8 or something like that. And the airplane was just climbing. We, it was doing 6,000 feet a minute probably. And because it's hit, we get the wings back. I think part of what's going on is the, there's a bit of a ram effect. The whole airplane's creating the, you know, the, the air, the air becomes a less compressible at that speed. It's like a boat, a speedboat planing on the water. Mm. I'm <clears throat> wouldn't be at all surprised if some of your listeners are just shaking your head going, God damn these pilots. <laughs> anyway, as the wing comes aft, the, it gets very close to the horizontal stabilizer, and there's really no room for the air to come up behind the wing. Right. Um, and so it just felt like the airplane suddenly just developed. But well, it's just amazing. So we're doing one eight. I don't. I'm not sure. I got any one eight or two zero. They were up there in the high forties. Pulling three 4G turns. Wow. And the airplane was just hauling ass. It loved it. You know, need for us to do that. Uh, but the airplane was going really fast. It was really smooth. And at that altitude, those conditions, the, the 72 and a half degree wing sweep really suited it. But if you got going much slower than that, the roll got sloppy because the spoilers which helped the roller lock out, even, even at training airspeeds. It just didn't have the sl the differential slabs just didn't have quite enough authority. So we'd always almost always go up forward at fifty at fifty. I want to say was it just after fifty four the spoilers started getting locked out. That was another reason we stepped we kept it at fifty four typically. And before we wrap up this, I want to ask this question. I think we might have talked about it in one of the previous episodes on even a, a live Q and A. But do you think uh, the F-111 could have hit Mach 3, you know, in 72.5 wing? I, as far as I know, and I can't, I think it was pretty common knowledge. I don't think it was rumor um, that a F-111D, which had a little more power than the uh, yeah. A and E, not as much as the F, was doing a functional check flight. and they just kind of just let's see how fast this will go and they violated mexican airspace at mach 3 because wow. turn radius so i think the airplane the the because of the 72 and a half degree wing sweep and i think this is true really practically speaking the airplane could never reach a structural aerodynamic speed limit because the airflow over the wing was effectively subsonic. Remember mm -hmm. that whole sign of, and so it was a subsonic wing. It wasn't a supersonic wing, it was subsonic. Yeah. Uh, and the only real limit on the airplane was skin temperature. Mm -hmm. And so we had a handy spot for it right behind it where you can see it. You had a skin temperature gauge. And if it exceeded uh, I don't know, 183 degrees or some silly number for more than you get, total temperature light on down the instrument panel uh, on the warning and caution panel will tell you that you had uh, I don't know some amount of time before you had to pull the again I can't remember it was not it was something you could have encountered it doing a high altitude dash but low altitude you run out of gas first yeah absolutely yeah. But, uh, yeah, Jeff, thank you very much for talking about the the wing sweep on the F111 but yeah to wrap up like how are things on your end anyway um, well, all things considered, I really can't complain. I'm, I'm living in Boise, Idaho now, and we live in the uh, foothills just a few miles north of Boise. It's beautiful here. I guess I, I do miss flying a bit. I haven't flown since as a pilot since I retired in April a year ago. Uh, but there's a lot of things surrounding it I don't miss. Mm -hmm. Living out of hotels living on airline food, packing and unpacking, you know, just, you know, all that other stuff that, that rolls along with it. And, you know, at some point it's a game that really doesn't re 
uh, age and experience help, but at some point you just got to say goodbye to it. And 65, I would have gone on longer if they hadn't dragged me out, but it's probably, you know, somewhere between that and about 70, you just really, it's, it's a good thing to not be doing anymore. But anyway, it's going great. It's real old. I'm, uh, I've been, uh, using up most of my time, with, uh, restoring a Volvo P1800, yeah, which is for the uh, TV series, The Saint. Mm-hmm. It was a co-star in that show. So this is my dad's. He's given it to my sister, and I'm restoring it for her, so it'll be reliable and drivable and all that stuff. Anyway, that's, that's what's going on. Well, hopefully, Jeff, when things you know ease up in the world, we can have a beer together, and I'll, I'll head to America. That'd be great. Well, and I, I don't want to avoid too much political commentary. Things never really got too locked down here in Idaho. And for about two or three months now, it's been, you know, no holds barred, whatever you want to do, wherever you want to do it, however many people you want to do it around. That's good. Somehow we still draw breath. (laughs) I know. Why we're not all dead in the streets, why we're all not react, uh, you know, reenacting the Monty plague, a Monty Python (laughs) bubonic plague scene. I don't know. It would be a miracle, but but somehow we're we're still all walking around having a good time. And, and I read about what's going on in England. It's like, oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's constant over here. But uh, yeah, it'd be great to uh, grab a beer with you, Jeff, at some point. Yeah, but, well, uh, uh, <laughs> next time I get over there, or if you ever, you know. Yeah, if I ever head to America, I would love to come over. But uh, yeah, Jeff, thank you very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. It was fun, and I hope I didn't uh, put any of your... your uh, listeners into a post-vegetative state. Absolutely not. Cheers, Jeff. Okay, bye.